Okay, we are today going to go through the last session of our Day of the Lord series. Originally, it was uh, designed to be five or six weeks, and it kind of morphed into eight weeks. And I'm glad that I had uh, the amount of time that I did to go through uh, the passages that we've looked at, uh, some in in detail, uh, because there's so much information in the Word of God concerning the day of the Lord. And it's really important that we take a look at the text and what the Bible actually says. Uh, I've, I've, I've shared on uh, several occasions in this series, it's important that we not look at Scripture through a theological system. Theological systems can be helpful. They can be helpful, but they are not Scripture. Theological systems are designed to help us arrange things in order so that we might understand them and so that we might explain them uh, in, a, in, a, in a logical manner. But when it comes to the text, we need to check our theological systems, our presuppositions, what we've been taught, we need to check that at the door unless we're coming in with the assumption that we are infallible in our interpretation. And I trust that none of us have that presupposition. None of us are infallible. It is the Word of God that's infallible. It's the Word of God that's inerrant. None of us completely understand the interpretation of the, of the Holy Spirit as it relates to Scripture. And in order for us to get closer and closer to that interpretation, we do so by examining the text. Now, godly men have written you know, incredible books, uh, have taught in, in, in seminaries that had a high view of Scripture, and I attended one of those seminaries, and I thank God for my teachers and my instructors. But it's very important that when we look at the Word of God, we allow the text to speak. And if it doesn't line up with what we've been taught, or if it doesn't line up with the theological system that we currently carry, then we need to find out why. And we need to make that, you know, make that determination with additional study. So this is Power to Stand. Uh, it's, a, it's a class that Pastor Steve and I primarily teach, and as I said before, we are coming to our last segment in our series. Whoops. The buttons here are really touchy today. There we go. The day of the Lord and the 70th seven, and eventually we're going to get to Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to give you a disclaimer here. Even though I'm going to teach through all four verses of the 77th prophecy of Daniel, it will not be an exhaustive presentation. It's going to be an overview flyby. Uh, I mean, I'm only going to give you some of the information. I could literally teach for three or four hours on those four verses. They are that packed. So we're only going to get a summary overview uh, of the passage. So if I don't answer a question or if I don't give information, understand that it's probably because I chose to not include it in the information that I did present. Or it may be that I'm currently unfamiliar with it. Okay, so this is the paragraph that I mentioned, uh, I don't know, it must have been about a month ago, and one of our uh, online viewers uh, wrote in requesting um, you know, the paragraph that I referenced from Shadows of the Beast by Jacob Prash. This is a book that came out in 2011, and it's a lengthy book, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Jacob uh, has a very well-developed vocabulary. For any of you who have read his books, you can attest to that. Uh, I read this particular book three times. Uh, in, in order to wrap my head around it. There's a lot of history in there. I was a history major at Ohio State, 
And I, I actually read it three times, and when I read it the third time, I felt like I had a handle of where Jacob was coming from. But in the, in the earlier pages of this book, when I read this paragraph for the very first time, it shook me to the core. Because I knew Jacob to be um, an excellent Bible teacher. I, I had listened to uh, some of his teachings and you know that had been uh, introduced uh, to a class that I was attending that was actually led by John Haller. And John and Jacob uh, met at a prophecy conference and, and John uh, would, would um, often recommend uh, Jacob's teachings on particular subjects. Well, when I read this paragraph, it, it shook me because it challenged one of the presuppositions that I had regarding the timing of the rapture, regarding the timing of the resurrection and the rapture. And the paragraph uh, reads as follows. The heart of the issue is found again in 2 Thessalonians 2, and we've already studied that passage, Taken literally and in context, Paul states that the rapture and resurrection and the consequent day of the Lord, when God pours out his wrath in the kingdom of Antichrist, will not occur until the man of lawlessness is revealed. And I had been taught a different approach. I had been taught a different understanding of the timing of the rapture. And so I literally spent the next 18 months of my life my wife will attest to this. We were married at the time. <laughs> You're still trying to prove Jacob wrong? Yes. Because I knew and I understood the implications. If I couldn't, uh, if I couldn't refute that paragraph, then I was going to have to change my theology that I had had for over three and a half decades. And so, I literally spent the next 18 months studying the day of the Lord from Scripture. I, I didn't read Jacob's book on Harpazo and the intra-seal resurrection and rapture of the church because it hadn't been written yet. That didn't come out until 2014. I didn't read Marvin Rosenthal's book on the pre-wrath rapture of the church because I had never heard of it. There's Arpazzo, there's the pre-wrath rapture of the church. This was written in 2014. This was actually first published in 1990. And I'll talk about this book a little later on. But all I did was study the scriptures regarding the day of the Lord, Old and New Testaments. And I spent a year until I finally came to the conclusion that what Jacob was saying about 2 Thessalonians 2 in this paragraph was actually reflective of the text itself. And so, I want you to understand that I've come to the position that I've come to not because of somebody's book, not, not because of uh, you know, reading you know, a position or a view that I found compelling, but because I was, I was driven to the Scriptures, I believe, by the Spirit of God to check out whether or not those things were so. And that is my personal testimony, and I will move on. Okay, so here's the passage. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, so that's the parousia and our gathering together. That's obviously the resurrection and the rapture. This is what Paul is talking about, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So Paul, in this passage, is making a connection to the day of the Lord with our gathering together to Jesus Christ. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come. What will not come? The day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship 
so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now we know from the context of 2 Thessalonians 2 that the Antichrist won't be revealed as the Antichrist until he commits the abomination of desolation. It's described several times in 2 Thessalonians 2, and it's, you know, it, it's actually referred to clearly uh, in, in verse 4. That is when he will, he will be revealed, when he takes his seat uh, in the temple. Okay, now we're talking about the day of the Lord and uh, Daniel's 70th 7 today, and how those two concepts uh, relate to each other. So let's go ahead and turn our attention uh, to uh, the text. But before I do, let me share with you some important uh, considerations. You hear me talk about the 70th 7 of Daniel. Why do I say the 70th 7 of Daniel rather than the tribulation period? Well, the reason that I use the 70th 7 is because that's talking about the seven-year period of time leading up to the return of Christ to the earth to defeat his enemies and to rescue his chosen people and establish his millennial kingdom, his messianic kingdom. Now, that seven-year period of time it's clear from Scripture that, that that will take place. I believe in that seven-year period of time. Nowhere in Scripture, not in a single reference, is the phrase tribulation period used to describe the 70th seven of Daniel. Not in one single verse. But it's the most common designation for that seven-year period of time. I use the scriptural designation, either the 70th week or the 70th seven. That's my preference. Another important consideration is to make a clear distinction between the great tribulation, which that's, that's Satan, the Antichrist, and the false beast going after the people of God. That's much different from the day of the Lord which is the wrath of God being poured out upon unbelievers who are rebellious uh, and who are refusing to repent of their sin and believe in the gospel. Those are two separate entities. They both occur during the second half of the 70th seven, according to the Bible. Because the Great Tribulation, as as taught by Jesus Christ in the Olivet Discourse, begins with the abomination of desolation. And the abomination of desolation, we know from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, takes place in the middle of the last seven years. And I'll make an effort to, to demonstrate that to you as we go along. The third important consideration that I want to emphasize, and, and again, uh, the, these are things that I've shared throughout this eight-week series, is, is the twofold um, approach of discernment and expectancy. When Jesus taught the Olivet Discourse, he majored on two principal themes. The first principal theme was, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. The second principal theme was, be alert, be ready, be prepared. So on the one hand, you have discernment, don't be deceived, don't fall for false teaching, don't fall for false Christ, don't be fooled by false prophets, but rather be expectant, be ready, be prepared for my return. He, he wants us to live our lives in such a way that we are expectantly awaiting his return to the earth. That is what he emphasized in that great uh, teaching during Passion Week. Okay, 
So let's take a look at the 77s of uh, Daniel 9. And when you study this, this passage, it's really important that you take the time to read through chapter 9, verses 1 through 23, which is a, an extended prayer on the part of, of the prophet Daniel to God, pouring out his heart, beseeching God to restore Jerusalem, to restore you know, the place of, of God's you know, chosen people in the world. He acknowledges the sin of the nation of Israel, and he, he prays for God's forgiveness, for God's mercy, and for God's grace in this prayer. And it's, it's one of the most um, stirring prayers that you'll find anywhere in the Bible. And it it serves as the backdrop for, for this prophecy that was, uh, was given to Daniel uh, by the angel that was sent. Seventy weeks, we can translate that, seventy sevens have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, the word that's translated uh, weeks in, in my translation, uh, the one that we're using for this particular slide, the New American Standard, uh, is uh, it's translated weeks. And it can mean literally mean seven, period of seven, either days or years. Uh, it can refer to a heptad or it can uh, actually be translated uh, weak as it is here. So it's, it's a word that, that gives you, uh, in, in most cases, a period of time, and that period of time is seven somethings. If it's a literal week, it's seven days. But it can also be a reference to a period of seven years. Let me demonstrate that for you uh, from uh, a passage in Genesis chapter 20, 29. Genesis chapter 29. You remember the account in the life of Jacob where he went to his uncle Laban and Laban had, um, had, had two daughters that uh, play a role in this, in this story. And one of them was beautiful. And Jacob wanted to work for, um, for Rachel's hand, right? Because she, uh, you know, she was beautiful. She was beautiful of form and face. And so you know, Laban said, well, how should we, you know, how should we do this? And Jacob agreed to work for seven years in exchange for the hand of Rachel. And he did that. Now, I want you to uh, look with me in your Bibles. I'll, I'll be reading from Genesis chapter 29. And I'll begin uh, with verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my time is completed, that I may go in to her. And Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came about in the evening that he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him, and Jacob went in to her. Laban also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. And it came about in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? Now, what's interesting about Jacob asking that question regarding deception? He, he was a deceiver too, right? Remember the trick that he pulled on his father with regard to his brother? Right. But Laban said, It is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Complete the seven of this one. Now, is he talking about a week of seven days or a week of seven years here? 
He's talking about a week of seven years. And we will give you the other also for the service which you serve with me for another seven years. So Laban's going to get two for the price of one. He's going to get 14 years of service from Jacob by pulling this switcheroo. And Jacob did so and completed her week, and he gave him Rachel as his wife. Laban also gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban for another seven years. Twice in this passage, it refers to this Hebrew word Shabua as referring to seven years. So I want you to understand it's a biblical usage, and it, as it turns out, that is what is in view in Daniel's uh, prophecy of the 77, 70, the sevens. Man, that's a mouthful. All right, so let's move on. Okay. It's decreed for your people and your holy city. So these are two of the verses. Um, I think it's two. Yeah. Verse 16 and verse 19. These are two of the verses that precede the 77th prophecy of Daniel. This is part of Daniel's prayer. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. So, Daniel is praying to God about the city of Jerusalem, your holy mountain, for because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people, that's a reference to the Jewish people, have become a reproach to all those around us. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action for your own sake. O oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. So the focus of Daniel's prayer is the restoration of the city of Jerusalem and the restoration of the Jewish people. Do you all see that? That's the focus of Daniel's prayer. And so, when we turn to, to Daniel chapter 9, and, and we read in verses 20 and 21, now, while I was still speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, that's a reference to Jerusalem. So his prayer is the Jewish people and God's holy city, Jerusalem. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the, the man Gabriel, the, the angel Gabriel came, whom I had seen in the vision previously. He came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. And he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Daniel was a humble man who came before God, confessed the sin of the people of Israel, and asked God for forgiveness. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. And so that leads to the point that, that the, actual, um, the actual vision, as it's laid out, 70 weeks have been declared for your people and your holy city. This seven-year period of time, seven, excuse me, this 490-year period of time, 77s of years, so if you have... Seven, seven years in one week, and there's 70 weeks, you multiply seven times 70, and that gives you 490 years. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. So the focus of this prophecy is on Jerusalem and the Jewish people. That is clear, and that is undeniable. 
And it, it is or, in order to fulfill these six things, and I've actually seen, seen these listed out of, as seven things, where number five, seal up vision and prophe prophecy, are, are split and separated uh, in order to make a list of seven. I have here a list of six. Not all of these things have been accomplished. In fact, most of them have not been accomplished yet. And with regard to the Jewish people, none of them have been accomplished yet. With regard to the remnant nation that is yet future. And that's what I mean uh, when I say that. Okay. So, let's look at verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Now I want you to notice, he says between the decree and Messiah the Prince, there's going to be 69 sevens. There's going to be seven sevens plus 62 sevens. And what is seven plus 62? Not a trick question. Seven plus 62 is 69. Thank you. Shout it out boldly. We remember some things from math class. Seven plus 62 is 69. So 69 of the 70 sevens are going to be fulfilled in between the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, that's not to be confused with the decrees that were given to rebuild the temple. That was a different deal. This is the, deg the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, including the streets, um, the plaza, and uh, the, the, the city itself. Okay. You are to know the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. So, 69 of the 77s, or 483 prophetic years, will take place between those two bookends of history. Now, we could spend an entire hour just on this material, and so I'm just going to throw this out there for your consideration. Uh, it's, it, it's something that I believe is, is, is worthy to consider, and that is to take the decree, which we know from history, this particular decree, to rebuild and restore Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes Longimanus, on March 14th, 445 B.C. We have the starting point. What we don't have is the meaning of the phrase Messiah the Prince. Now, there's a book. How many of you have ever read the book by Sir Robert Anderson, The, the Coming Prince? Anybody? It's a classic. Just Yeah, it's a classic. Uh, if, you can get a, if you can get a hold of a copy... Um, I, I, would, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, as far as I'm aware, he is the first one to come up with, with this calculation. Sir Robert Anderson, The Coming Prince. In history, the Jewish calendar, as well as some other calendars, instead of using 365 days, they used 360 days in their calendar. And to correct for the missing, uh, is it six and a quarter days? Or no, five and a quarter days. F five and a quarter days, 365 and a quarter days. So every fourth year we have leap year, which is adding an extra day to February. That's how we make up the difference. Well, the Jews in ancient times, they had an extra month that they would add to the calendar every, every so often in order to, in order to um, 
kind of set the clock on, on the right time. Uh, because, you know, God's time frame had to do with, you know, with the various harvest cycles of the year. Uh, you know, the spring harvest and the fall harvest. And so it was important for them to have those things um, operating and functioning correctly. So if you take 300 and if you take 360 days and you multiply it by 70 years, so 360 times 70, we're using a Jewish prophetic year here for the number of days, you come to the number 173,880 days. Now, in his calculations, allowing for corrections for leap years, Sir Robert Anderson postulated that Jesus Christ entered into the city of Jerusalem on a particular day, I believe it was on April the 6th, 32 A.D., which was exactly 173,880 days after the decree. Now, I know there's dispute as to the chronology of, of the birth of Jesus Christ, of his life, when did he die, there, there are good and godly men who disagree on these dates and on these issues. I'm just throwing out this particular view uh, as one that is worthy of consideration. Now, I want, I want you to put on your theological thinking caps. Who is in view in this prophecy? Who and what is in view in the 77th prophecy of Daniel, specifically. It's decreed for, for what place? Jerusalem. It's decreed for what people? The Jews. So, it's Jerusalem and the Jews. I want you to think in your mind, was there ever a time in the first coming of Jesus Christ where he publicly presented himself as king to the Jewish people in fulfillment of of Old Testament prophecy in the city of Jerusalem. Was there ever a time he did that? He did it on Palm Sunday. He intent, remember before that, he would, he, what would he tell people? Tell no one what I've done. Tell no one who I am. It was a messianic secret. And it, it wasn't until the time leading up to his death, burial, and resurrection, that Jesus Christ went public and, you know, unveiled his true identity. And he intentionally rode in on a donkey, which I believe the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, in chapter 9 and verse 9, if I have the reference correct, was picturing the entrance of the king into Jerusalem. Jesus Christ presented himself as king. Now, what did the crowd shout? Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they threw down garments and they threw down the foliage of various trees. And, and John tells us specifically that they put down palm branches. Now, why is that important that he give that detail? Well, it's because the people were looking at this incorrectly. They were commanded by God to put down foliage, foliage of leafy branches and particularly palm branches during what festival, what feast of the Lord were they to do that with? The Feast of Tabernacles, which happens in the fall. This, you know, this is leading up to Passover. This is five days before Passover, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on Friday. It's five days before Passover with the triumphal entry, and it's, it's the first feast of the spring. It's the first feast of the Jewish calendar. Seven feasts of the Lord recorded in Leviticus chapter 23. They were wanting the Feast of Tabernacles. They were wanting the Messianic Kingdom. They were wanting the Messiah to throw off Roman rule. 
It wasn't time for that. They were getting it wrong. Remember when Jesus said, you'll not see me until you, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Remember he said that? You know, just, just prior to, to his death, it was actually the day before his death. Well, five days earlier, the people had quoted that passage from Psalm 118. And he's saying that passage is yet future. That passage is my second coming. All right. So let's look at Luke 19. And again, this is, this is just for consideration. You know, from my perspective, it fits that he presented himself as Messiah the Prince on the day of the triumphal entry. And look what he says about this day. Now, you would think after the people shouted, blessed is, is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, according to Luke 19.38, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the you know, Pharisees were grumbling and complaining, tell, you know, tell the people to be quiet. And Jesus said, if the, if the people were silenced, the very rocks themselves would cry out as to my true identity. Now you would think, since they're proclaiming him king, he would rejoice in that, right? No. Look at what, it, look at what the text says. Verse 41 through 44. In fact, I think I got a slide. When he approached, when he approached the city, he saw the city and he wept over it. This was not a mountaintop experience. This was a valley experience for Jesus because he knew that the city would be judged because of their unbelief, because of their rejection of him, because the Jews as a nation would follow the scribes and the Pharisees and their teachings, their false teachings of oral law, and their rejection of Jesus as the anointed one of God, and, and the city of Jerusalem would be judged approximately a generation later in 70 A.D. He wept over the city. Now look at what he says, verse 42. If you had known in this day, this day, the day he rode in, they should have recognized. They should have understood. Daniel gave them the clues necessary. They should have recognized that he indeed was Messiah the Prince. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Now, days later, on the Mount of Olives, He's going to give a teaching that's in reference to this statement. You know, the, the, the disciples came up to him and, and said, look at the temple buildings, Jesus. And he said, I, I tell you, not one stone will be left upon another, what you see here. It's all going to be torn down in judgment. And of course, that happened in 70 AD. Now, here's why. They will, they will not leave in you one stone upon another because because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. His entry into the city of Jerusalem was on that day. If you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but you've been blinded, you don't understand, you don't acknowledge me for who I truly am. And as a result, the city and the people were judged almost a generation later. Okay. Let's look at verse 26 of Daniel 9. So, do you understand that the 60, this is according to my interpretation, in my view, which again is my opinion, 
I want you to understand, the 69th seven ended before Jesus Christ ever died and rose again. It ended five days before. If I understand these things correctly. All right. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. So after, after the first 69 weeks, but, but you say, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Mike. It says in verse 26, after the 62 weeks. But how has, how has Gabriel arranged the time sequence? What comes before the 62 weeks? Back in verse 24. Or excuse me, uh, back in verse 25. What comes before the 62 weeks? The seven weeks. So if you have 62 weeks, which is preceded by seven weeks, and it says after the 62 weeks, what is it assuming from a, from a Hebrew point of view? It's assuming the first seven weeks. So it's after the 69th week. After the 69th seven. It's a little confusing for our Western mindset. It's a Middle Eastern concept. It's an Eastern concept of time. And our Western minds struggle with biblical terminology sometimes because we, we, we want to interpret things straight out chronologically. Well, sometimes the Bible is not chronological in its time sequence. Sometimes it jumps around. And it drives us batty, right? <laughs> wait, wait a minute, where are we? I thought we were over here, and now we're over there. And the Bible does that sometimes. Because time is fluid from a, from a, from a Hebrew point of view. Okay, from a Jewish point of view. All right, then after the 62 weeks, which I understand to be a reference to the 69 sevens, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Now, was there ever a time in the first coming of Jesus Christ where there was an event that we can describe as the Messiah being cut off and having nothing? What is that event? The crucifixion, absolutely. So does it make sense that the triumphal entry signals the end of the 69th seven? I think it does. Because after the 69th seven, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. I believe that's the crucifixion. And there's another historical event. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. Now, there were... There were actually two events that took place following the, the 69th, the completion of the 69th seven. And, and those two events are the crucifixion and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70, in 70 AD. Okay, let's... Actually, well, I don't have time. I'll make time. Um, there have been various interpretations of the people of the prince who is to come. And the prince who is to come, that's a reference uh, not to Jesus Christ, but to the Antichrist. Uh, some people get that all twisted. But th that's a reference to the Antichrist, the prince who is to come. And one of the... One of the uh, prevalent views out there is that the Antichrist will come from a revived Roman Empire. Now, that may be true, but you need to understand you shouldn't look at a revived Roman Empire simply from the Western Roman Empire. There was also an Eastern Roman Empire, correct? And what is the vast majority of the countries and lands and peoples that now currently populate the Eastern Roman Empire? 
They're Muslims. And so a, a more recent view is that the Antichrist may be Islamic. And if he is, it'll still fit that picture of a revived Roman Empire because remember there were there were there were two legs <laughs> that 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 ultimately you know manifested themselves. You know, one based in Rome and and the other in um, Constantinople, I believe, if I remember my history correctly. Okay. Uh, that was not part of the notes. That that was uh, no extra charge, and if I muddied the waters by doing that, I apologize. All right, so let's go to the final verse. And he, he, now when you see a pronoun in a Bible verse, what should you immediately ask when you see the word he in verse 27? Who is he? And how do we determine who he is? The most recent antecedent is where we start. The people of the prince who is to come. Now, in verse 25, you have Messiah the prince. In verse 26, you have the prince to come. And some people equate those two. You shouldn't do that. He will make a firm covenant he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week now let's let's maintain our interpretive you know model what is in view in the 77s what place is in view the city of jerusalem what people are in view the jews you've got the city of jerusalem and the jewish people in view in Daniel 77. And what it says, he, the prince who is to come, will make a firm covenant with the many. The many who? The many Jews in and around Jerusalem. I believe we're talking about the modern state of Israel here, people. Again, that's my opinion. But that fits. You know, we live in a time which is prophetically significant. In 1948, the Jewish people took possession of what we now call the modern state of Israel. And on May 4th, I think it was, it was in May 1948, they declared themselves to be an independent nation. Then, during the June 1967 war, they took control of what city? The city of Jerusalem. And for a few hours, they actually took control of the Temple Mount. But then uh, the general that had the eye patch, uh, Moshe Dayan, yeah, thank you. Moshe Dayan, he gave that to the Muslim Wath to oversee and control the Temple Mount. They had control of the Temple Mount. I believe there was a Jewish flag raised on the Temple Mount. And in 1967, Moshe Dayan gave control of the Temple Mount to the Muslims. And it's been in dispute ever since. And that'll be the focal point of the dissension going forward as well. He will make a firm covenant with the many Jews for, for one week or one seven. For, for how many years? For seven years. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, why is it important that we identify the prince who is to come as the Antichrist and not Jesus Christ? Somebody explain it to me. It's not rocket science. Because if the prince who is to come is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is going to commit the abomination of desolation. That, that's not happening, folks. <laughs> okay? He is not a desolator. 
He is holy and righteous and true. It is the Antichrist who is the desolator. It's the Antichrist who is the counterfeit imposter of Satan, who will be empowered for 42 months, which equals three and a half years by Satan himself, according to Revelation chapter 13. All right. So, he'll put a stop to the uh, sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. This is clearly the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. And this is the verse that Jesus refers to in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. When he cites Daniel the prophet as describing the event that we call the abomination of desolation. And that's recorded for us in um, Matthew's account of the Olivet Discourse, chapter 24, verse 15, Mark's account, chapter 13, verse 14. And as we read earlier from the slide, it's described in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Okay, so... The Bible is so precise. In the middle of the seven, what is seven divided by two? Three and a half or 3.5. Three and a half years. How long did the rain stop during the days of Elijah? Three and a half years, according to the book of James, as well as according to Jesus Christ in one of the gospel accounts. Take a look at these references to three and a half years. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. Use the phrase time, times, and half a time. Now, in the original, in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 12, the word times is not plural. It's not in the plural form. Because in the, the original, it's actually more precise than our English language. In English, if we, if we want to say one, one week, we use the word week. If we want to say more than one week, what word do we use? Weeks. We put an S on it. We use the plural form. Well, the original had a plural form, and it had a singular form, but it also had something in between called the dual form. And that's what's in play here in Daniel 7 and Daniel 12. The dual form. And in the dual form, it can mean two and only two. Everybody understand? It can only mean two. So you have two, you have one time, you have one time plus two times. One plus two is three plus half a time. That's three and a half times. Now, we don't know for certain from this passage in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 12 that that's a reference to three and a half years. But we do know from Daniel chapter 9 that there's going to be a three and a half something period of time. We believe that it's a seven year period of time, so three and a half years at, at the end of, of this present age, prior to the return of, of Christ to establish his messianic kingdom. So you have time, times, and half a time. Now what's interesting to me is that John intentionally uses this, this, this phrasing in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 14 where he says time, times, and half a time. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6, he uses the same event, he describes the same event, and instead of saying time, times, and half a time, he says 1,260 days. And if you divide 1,260 by 360 days of a Jewish prophetic year, what does that equal? 360 into 1,260. It equals exactly 3.5. Exactly. John gives us what time, times, and half a time means 
without any question, without any doubt, without any speculation. He tells us what it means. And he told us that almost 2,000 years ago. Over 1,900 years ago. All right. So, you've got this phrase, time, times, and half a time. You have the, uh, you, you have the designation 42 months uh, that the city of Jerusalem uh, will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. And also, the, the, the amount of uh, time given uh, authority to Antichrist by Satan personally. 42 months. And then you also have the phrase either 1,260 days or 1,260 days. In Revelation 11.3, the time of the prophesying of the two witnesses, as well as in 12.6, the time when uh, the woman who flees to the wilderness, who flees to the wilderness in obedience to the instruction and warning of Jesus Christ from the Olivet Discourse, they are protected for 1,260 days, time, times, and half a time. So, in Revelation 11, Revelation 12, and Revelation 13, five different times you have three different, different designations for three and a half years. That is the overwhelming focus of Scripture with regard to the 70th seven. It's with regard to the second half of the 70th seven, not the first half of the 70th seven. And the second half of the 70th seven begins with what we call the abomination of desolation, which also initiates what Jesus calls the great tribulation in Matthew chapter 24. All right. So, what does the second half of the 70th seven have to do with the day of the Lord? Well, we know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the day of the Lord will not take place, will not happen, will not begin until after the man of lawlessness is revealed. And we're told in the context of 2 Thessalonians 2 that he's revealed when he takes his seat in the temple and declares himself to be God in the flesh. And he desolates the Holy of Holies. All right. My, I, I went over today. I apologize. Um, I, am, uh, I thought I could do a, a flyby, and I ended up adding extra stuff. And Let me see if I can wrap this up quickly. Okay, I've got two more slides that I really want to share with you. Turn to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 3 and 4 for you. Uh, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Now, this next phrase, I was, I was taught you know, from the early 1970s when I read The Late Great Planet Earth, by the way, I'm not denigrating uh, Hal Lindsey or, or his ministry. More people came to Christ through that book than any other single book in my lifetime that I'm aware of. An incredible number of people came to Christ because of that book. But you know, in his book, he interpreted this last phrase as you know, the expanse of travel on planet Earth and the dawn of the computer age. Now, it's true. We, you know, we fly from here to there in a short period of time. And you can't keep up with the knowledge anymore, right? You know, our computers are obsolete. I, I have a computer that's, I think, 10 years old. I don't use it anymore. I mean, it, you know, there are some young folks in the, in the room that are like, how can you have a computer that's 10 years old? How is that possible? <laughs> Yet I do. All right. Uh, but I do have an iPad. Thank, thank the Lord for iPads. Yes. Um, so, so while there's been this great increase in knowledge, we need, we need to interpret the text in light of the text. 
And what was, what was the phrase immediately preceding? Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Until the end of time. What's going to happen at the end of time prior, prior to the end of the age? When, you know, when the prophetic word is no longer sealed as it, as it had been, Many will go back and forth. Many will go back and forth in the prophetic word. And knowledge will increase. Knowledge of the prophetic word will, will increase as people study prophecy. Now, there's this great dichotomy. On the one hand, there's this, this great movement within the body of Christ to deny prophecy on any level. And then you've got a few folks who are crazy about prophecy. And I'm probably one of those folks. It's important. Jesus warned us about these things. See, I warned you beforehand. I warned you ahead of time. Behold, take heed. I warned you ahead of time about these things. And so, I believe this is speaking about the prophetic word. There'll be an increased study on the part of some. Maybe, maybe it's only a few. But there'll be increased study, and as a result of that increased study, knowledge will increase. Look at verses 9 and 10. He said, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Now, the book of the Revelation, John was commanded not to seal up the book of the Revelation. But Daniel was sealed until the end of the age. Until the time leading up to the return of Christ. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. And who are the ones who have insight, according to verses 3 and 4? It's the ones who go to and fro in the prophetic word and have their knowledge increased by the illuminating ministry of the Spirit of God in their lives. Okay, I think that is it. And we are done. Thank you very much. Uh, I tell you what, let's pray, and the, those of you that want to stay for questions can, okay? But I want you to turn the camera off after we pray, okay? Okay, thanks. Father, thank you for this time, and we uh, pray, Father, for your grace in our lives as we consider uh, these passages, some of them difficult. Thanks for these folks who have come to study your word. I pray your blessing upon them. Uh, I appreciate them so much, Father. And uh, we want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.